and uh, welcome to BCBT day two. And uh, I think we have a very exciting day in prospect. Uh, we talked yesterday uh, quite a lot about uh, evolution, um, so, sort of in, in general terms, and perhaps also about the sort of outcome of evolution. But today we're going to hear about the true milestones of the evolution of nervous systems in vertebrates. And our first talk is going to tell us about the evolution, I think, of mammalian cortex uh, primarily, uh, and also about the remarkable properties of, of mammalian cortex to change during our lifetimes. And our speaker, Leo Krubitzer, is, uh, I think, uh, very well known uh, for the research he's been doing for the past a few decades, uh, starting out with John Cass, who was a PhD supervisor, but then moving on to have her own lab at a University of California in Davis, where she's looking at the partitioning of cortex between different modalities, particularly looking at sensory areas of cortex and how, the, how those might change as a result of experience. And in, in the field, which I think has become known as EvoDevo, evolution development, uh, this work has been enormously influential and it's really making people reevaluate their idea about cortex and also about the evolution and development of mammalian cortex. So uh, Leia's a very good friend, and this is her second time at BCBT. So we're really delighted to have her back. Leia. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. OK, so, um, so before I start, uh, this is my second time. So my first time, I was the first speaker of the first day, and I'd never met Paul. And I'm just like, some guy keeps interrupting me every single time I say something. So that's OK. I'm, 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 I'm all over it now. But if I'm not going to get through my talk, I'm going to have to cut you off. Mm -hmm. All right. You were pretty mellow that day, though. <laughs> were you? Yeah. You were, I, was, I was so jet lagged. I got in the day before, and it kind of just was like went over my head. Um, OK, so the old title of my talk used to be, How Does Evolution Build a Complex Brain? And I got away from the title of evolution, because evolution generally deals traditionally with, um, with genes. And the, the title of my talk, the, the, the first picture used to be a brain because I'm interested in cortical field evolution. But I've come to realize that you can't just consider, and, and Paul made this point really well yesterday, that you can't just consider anything that you're interested in in isolation, that there are various levels of organization. And certainly when you're talking about the, the brain and the neocortex, you have to think about the body. So these are uh, drawings of different rodents. So I love the rodent model, but of course these are all rodents. We're used to working on something that looks like a mouse, but in reality, bodies have changed dramatically in different rodents. You have rodents that fly, you have rodents that hop, you have rodents that are semi-aquatic, and so on and so forth. Um, when I went to Australia, I was there for six and a half years, and I had to catch every single animal that I worked on. It gave me a, a really good insight into animal brains by having to catch them and see what they were all about, right? Because until that time, I was in graduate school, I was in John Cause's lab, you'd get a monkey, there'd be a brain, you'd listen to the brain, you'd look at the connections of the brain, and it was all about the brain. And when I went to Australia, it was about the animal, and catching the animal gives you some good insight. Um, so that's my first slide. And, oops. So the neocortex, and as Paul said, it's embedded in a body that has special effectors for, in terms of the humans, it's the hands and the eyes. Um, and these bodies, um, interact with other bodies and form social systems that affect brain and other social systems and other groups of animals um, on a physical planet. So it's not just the neocortex. There are larger levels of organization. And more and more, we're beginning to appreciate that early development and certainly early social interactions with language, cult culture, and, and even larger societies. We have educational systems that determine what experiences young brains should have and how those brains should be shaped. And if we, look, if we decompose a neocortex, it's composed, this is from Olaf Sporns, um, of, of macro circuits um, that consist of different cortical areas. And those are con composed of micro circuits, which are composed of neurons with synapses that have receptors or proteins embedded in their membrane. And that's determined by genes. And ultimately, we're finding now with the new field of epigenetics that larger, larger systems of organizations or early behavior or early experience can actually affect transcription um, and expression of genes, and those things that genes control. So this is a picture of a, uh, a uh, dolphin neocortex in the back. This is a picture of a little uh, marsupial from Australia, the native cat. That's the portion of the brain I'm interested in, is the neocortex. And you can see it varies dramatically in size. And the reason I'm interested in the neocortex is it's the portion of the brain that's thought to be involved in volitional motor control, complex pl 
complex behaviors, perception, attention, a, a, a lot of the things that we associate with, I hate to use the word intelligence or complexity. Um, <clears throat> It's also the portion of the brain that's changed most dramatically in mammals over time compared to the spinal cord or brain stem, and I would even contend compared to the, th the, the uh, dorsal thalamus. So, so first of all, you know, we can see that the neocortex is greatly expanded, and generally animals that have a relatively large neocortex um, have a, a constellation of complex behaviors, whether they're uh, covert behaviors like cognition and language or, 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 or things like that, or overt behaviors, although small brain mammals can have very complex behaviors as well. But it's not just the size of the cortical sheet that's important. And we've known for a long time, this is from Corbin, Corbinian Brodman in 1909, he did a beautiful architectonic analysis of the cortex. He sectioned the brain, uh, stained it for uh, uh, cell bodies, um, and he found that the cortex is not homogeneous, but it's composed of a number of different parts. This is a human brain. This is a marmoset brain, and this is a hedgehog brain. But you can see the human brain has this hugely expanded cortical sheet, and you have this little tiny, tiny cap um, of, a, of a neocortex on a European hedgehog. What he noted was that there are regions of the, these regions of the brain look differently. He didn't do any electrophysiology. He just looked at the brain and said it's not homogeneous. His proposition was that the, those regions that look different um, were functionally different or functionally distinct and, and accounted for our many abilities. What he also noticed, and most people don't talk about this, was that he can identify similar regions that look the same in a human brain and a hedgehog brain. So my question is, one other point, is that if you look at, if you look at these number of divisions, which subsequently, um, and, and we know from modern fMRI, but also from electrophysiological studies in monkeys and so on, that these architectonic divisions or these areas that look different actually seem to have different functions. Neurons are interested in responding to different types of stimulation from things as simple as oriented lines to things as complex as faces. Um, that the human brain seems to have, have many, many of these. And if you talk to primate um, evolutionary neurobiologists, they will contend that human brains have 250 cortical fields or 300 independent fields that are defined in a variety of ways. Or something like a hedgehog, which may reflect, or, or a monodelphus, or something with, with a small brain, probably reflects the ancestral state of, ancestral st state of mammals um, that evolved about 200 million years ago. And they have maybe 12, 15 cortical fields. So the question is, how do you get from something like this to something like this? And it's not that a hedgehog evolved into a human, but this is, if this reflects the ancestral state of all mammals, how did you get something as extraordinary as that? So that is my question. How does the brain evolve from a very simple form with a couple of cortical fields, and these are indicated by different colors, um, to a more complicated form with many, many parts that are, interconne that are interconnected in different ways that generate a number of these complex behaviors that we associate with different species? So. The conceptual approach is as follows. So the question is a hard question to answer because I can't study evolution directly. So the types of changes that I'm talking about take tens of millions to hundreds of millions of years, um, or at least tens of thousands. Um, so I can't, in terms of mammal brains, I, I can't sit there and say, OK, how does this go from this? There are two ways we can get around this, this problem of the, that evolution cannot be studied directly. And one is to study the products of, the, of evolution. What has evolution produced? So, Evolution has produced brains. So I could study a lot of different brains in a lot of different species, and I can say, OK, what are the similar features of organization? If these are similar features of organization that I see in every single species I studied, the most parsimonious explanation is that it's been inherited from a common ancestor, that it didn't evolve de novo in every single lineage you know, thousands of times. And, and that comparative approach has, has generated a lot of important and good data. Of course, it's all inferential, um, but but it, I think the inferences are, can be more or less accurate depending on the number of species that you examine and the ways in which you examine them. Okay, but so, so I say, okay, I have, I have this brain, this brain, this brain, this brain, and they have um, these types of similarities, these types of differences. So the comparative approach will tell us what evolution has produced, but it doesn't tell us how those transitions occur. So if I see something like a human and I see something like a macaque monkey and I say, well, I could see these similarities, but there are some really big differences. How might those differences have, ha, have arisen? The evolution of the neocortex is the evolution of developmental mechanisms that give rise to some aspect of the cortical phenotype. So the second way is to study developmental mechanisms that, give, that, that, that generate some aspect of phenotype, uh, cortical phenotype, whether it's um, structure, whether it's connectivity, whether it's function of neurons, and so on and so forth. That kind of analysis tells us how changes have occurred, how these transitions have occurred or may have occurred. So for this talk, um, 
I'll go very briefly through the kind of methods slash levels of investigation. And Paul made a really good point. Um, in addition to, to brains being embedded in bodies, a, a related point is that there are high, there's a hierarchical level of organization. You can, there are people who look at molecules. There are people who look at cells. There are people who do physiology. There are people who do um, whole brain. There are people who do fMRI, people who do behavior. They're all interrelated. I mean, it's really difficult to relate a gene, although people are trying, the gene for you know, language or the gene for, for memory and all that sort of stuff, although I, I don't quite believe in that. Um, but there are these different levels of, of organization. So what we've tried to do in our laboratory, sometimes pretty well and sometimes it's gotten a little hard, is to look at multiple levels of organization. So this talk today is, I'm, I'm, gonna, in, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some molecular and genetic stuff that I'll talk about, but it's not from my own laboratory because I, I don't do that, but I'd like to consider it. Consider it. Um, talk about cellular composition, we've started doing some it's isotropic fractionator, I'll describe it later in my talk, but basically you can look at, you could take some chunk of cortical tissue and you can calculate the number of neurons within that chunk, uh, the density of neurons, the percentage of neurons, the number of non-neurons to get some sort of feeling of the cellular composition. I'll do electrophysiology, so these different cortical fields have different respon neural response properties, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Neuroanatomy, looking at the connections of different fields. Um, and ultimately, some of our newer stuff is behavior. So I'm going to show you some of that. And I was talking to Tony, of all the things I've ever done in my entire life, this is the, the most difficult, um, is the behavioral part. But I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. So I'm going to show you some behavior stuff, and you're going to think, oh my god, that's really simple. But oh, it, took, it took a long time to, to generate. OK, so, so Tony said I've been doing this for like, man, like 25 years, a quarter of a century. That's a long time. And last night at the, t at the dinner table, I said, I still don't know how the brain works. And I really don't. But I know some things about the brain. And a comparative analysis has yielded some really interesting data. This is a little phylogenetic tree. You don't have to worry about you know, what blue field is versus, versus red field versus uh, yellow field. But these uh, different fields, a similar field or a homologous field, meaning inherited from, from a common ancestor, is color coded in the same way. So blue is visual cortex. Um, Red is primary somatosensory cortex. Green or yellow is primary auditory cortex. So using electrophysiological recording techniques, neuroanatomical techniques, anatom anatomical techniques um, combined, or architectonic techniques combined, we can subdivide the neocortex in a variety of species. And this is some work from my own lab and other laboratories. And we can, we can um, make really strong inferences about an unknown form. Until you know, about 20 years ago or 15 years ago, before non-invasive imaging really came online, we didn't know a lot about the human condition, except from post-mortem studies of architecture, for example. And we certainly don't know about the common ancestor, except from fossil records. We know how big their brain was. We know it didn't have fissures. We knew they had a large, large olfactory bulb. But if I do this comparative analysis, I could see that there's this constellation of cortical fields that all species have, regardless of use. So for example, if I look at something like a blind mole rat, skin has grown over its eyes. It's become microphthalmic. They probably use their visual system for circadian functions, but not for classic visual functions. They still have a primary visual cortex. They still have a geniculocortical pathway. They can't get rid of it. They've sh it's, it's gotten really small, and other regions of sensory cortex, like somatosensory cortex, have gotten large, but they can't seem to get rid of it. So it's not super efficient. That suggests that there are some underlying constraints in how you can build a nervous system, or how evolution builds a nervous system. This type of analysis also allows me to appreciate the ancestral form. So, I mean, Almost everything we know about the human brain comes from work on animals. It doesn't come directly from work on human brain. And even modern fMRI stuff is more validation um, of what we knew from monkeys um, than really, really novel sorts of things. So doing this comparative analysis, the most parsimonious explanation, if I don't know a human condition or an ancestral condition, um, is that um, it has this general plan of organization, that this general plan of organization did not arise independently in every single lineage, but it was inherited from a common ancestor. So that's a, a little basic um, overview of the comparative approach. Having said that, I'm not saying all brains are the same. There are some real differences in, in the neocortex. So this is a macaque monkey that's been flattened out. This is the medial portion of the brain. This is the front of the brain. Here's the back of the brain. Here's a little mouse brain. Um, you can see the scales are quite different. Um, here's the front of the brain. Here's the top of the brain. And these are flattened views of the cortex and kind of the views I'm going to show th throughout the rest of the talk. Um, here's the primary somatosensory cortex in red, primary somatosensory cortex, primary visual cortex, visual cortex, auditory cortex. So without me going through you know, what all these different cortical fields are, you can see just by looking at it, there is this constellation has significant alterations. Um, there's an 
a huge change in the relative size of the cortical sheet, number of cortical fields, the relative size of cortical fields, the position of cortical fields. Um, so this is a little overview of some of those changes. And I've done this in a schematic form. So I'll just talk you through this. This, is the, this represents the uh, cortical sheet size, small, a large size, small size. Sensory, there's, there are changes. So these are the types of general modifications that have been made to brain. So, so I'm going to talk about systems level modifications. So if you do this comparative analysis, you say, OK, I can identify a common plan of organization. But then I can identify differences. And it turns out, if you look at differences of, of mammalian neocortex, from a systems level, and I suspect from a cellular level, although I haven't looked at that, they take a similar form. Brains don't change in any, any old way. And this, there's a handful of ways that have been identified in which brains change. So you can have changes in the size of the cortical sheet. You have animals that have a little tiny, teeny neocortex, animals that have a really large neocortex. You have changes in sensory domain allocation. So how much of my brain is devoted to processing visual inputs versus somatosensory inputs versus auditory inputs? If I looked at something like an echolocating bat, I have a huge amount of cortex that's devoted to processing auditory inputs. And if I look at something like a human or a, or a, a monkey, I have a huge amount of cortex that's devoted to processing um, visual inputs. I have changes in the relative size of cortical fields. So as I've expanded my cortical sheet, um, and I look at a cortical field like the primary visual cortex as a percentage of the entire cortical sheet, those values change in different species. Is the, the right column, is that mouse? Or? No, no, no. So this is, so the right column is just differences. So for example, this is a cortical sheet, right, so I can have something that has um, if, if this is auditory, a huge auditory domain and a small visual domain, or something that has a very large visual domain or a small visual domain. Relative size, something that has a relatively small neocortex versus a relatively large neocortex. And I'm going to show, like this is my schematic, which is supposed to be a simplified version, which obviously is a complicated version. <laughs> but I'm going to show examples of these in real animal brains. Um, a magnification of beha behaviorally relevant body parts. So this is a cortical sheet. This is a cortical field. Um, let's say this is a specialized body part in S1. It could be a hand. It could be a bill. It could be a nose. And so I have more space devoted to that representation than, let's say, other portions of my body. I have the addition of modules, which I'll explain in a little bit, which are subdivisions within the cortical sheet. I have an increase in, or changes in the number of cortical fields, lots of cortical fields or smaller cortical fields. And really important, which I think is what one of the things that differentiates mammal brains from other brains, is alterations in connections of cortical fields. Yeah, just to get us all on the same page, to, to now make this comparison across, let's say, different species, how do you exactly define what's S, S1 or V1? That's on just morphological constraints or functional? Or OK, so that's a really good question. So, how, so the criteria that you use to define a field is, gonna, is going to increase the accuracy of your inference. So when, we're, so when we're defining a cortical field, so Broadman just looked at architecture. He cut the brains, he looked at cells, he said, OK, I'm looking at laminar differences between this field and this field. The best way is to use multiple criteria to define a field. So if I'm going to define S1, and I really stick a lot to primary fields because across species, they're, they're, they're relatively easy to define. They have a very distinct architectonic appearance. If I stick an electrode in the brain, neurons respond in a very classic fashion. So in somatosensory cortex, neurons are responsive, primary somatosensory cortex, responsive to tactile stimulation of the body, there's a representation, a topographic representation from medial to lateral. You're representing the foot, um, the, the arm, the hand, the face. There, there's going to be differential magnification within that representation. For visual cortex, I'm representing the contralateral hemifield for primary visual cortex. In that same animal, I might stick an, a neuroanatomical tracer within S1, and it has some classic pattern or similar pattern of thalamocortical connection. So in, for example, for S1, all species examined get input from the ventral posterior nucleus of the thalamus. So there's, there's some really uh, fundamental properties of, of primary fields and second fields as well. But the, the best way to differentiate the cortex and break it into these different parts is to use architecture, electrophysiology, neuroanatomy all combined. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can feel very confident or relatively confident of your, of your cortical fields. With the caveat, when you get into fields in the temporal lobe of primates or posterior parietal cortex, things get a little more sketchy. And, and I think, well, I'll talk about why I think that's so. Is that, does that clarify that? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. That's very good. Okay. So, so what, what factors contribute to these modifications? Genetic versus epigenetic. And by epigenetic, I mean activity-driven or context-dependent. So 
when people are looking at the neocortex, and certainly developmental neurobiologists, when they're saying, what, are the, what is the genetic contribution to, how does V1 become V1? How does it get its architectonic appearance? How do, how do neurons come to acquire the properties that they acquire? How does it get its connectivity? Well, early in development, there are genes that generate some patterns um, that will make V1 V1. And those genes are intrinsic to the neocortex. This is really important, and it relates to brain-body relationships. There are also genes that regulate how the body is generated during development. And you will see that the body, how the body's organized, receptor density, specialized morphology, has a huge impact on how the neocortex is organized. So genes extrinsic to the neocortex, but intrinsic to the animal, can also have an impact on some of these sort of systems level changes I just talked about. Then there's activity dependent, and I'm gonna talk a lot about this um, towards the end of my talk. Our question is, can we induce these modifications in a developing nervous system and generate a phenotype that is consistent with what we think evolution would produce? So in order to say, I think cortical field size is generated by X, can I change X, for example, and I'll, I'll show you some of these experiments, and change cortical field size in a way, and, and have changes in cortical field organization, changes in the size of the cortical field, changes in connectivity, and so on and so forth, in ways that mimic what evolution would do in order to test some of our theories of development. What time did I start? I started later, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 22, 10, you okay, okay. So I'm going to talk about intrinsic, intrinsically mediated aspects of cortical organization, cortical sheet size, cortical field size, internal organization, and connectivity. So in a developing brain, there are you know, things that are intrinsic to the neocortex that are going to generate some of these aspects of organization. And this is, so first of all, how does the cortical sheet change in size? So when I talk about changes in the size of the cortical sheet, it happens in two different ways. One, an animal can simply get larger. So you have direct scaling. So this is a guinea pig brain. Guinea pig weighs 700 grams. Here's V1, S1, and A1 in this sort of general pattern of organization. This is another rodent. It's a capybara. It weighs 91 kilos. Now, this is based on architectonic analysis and I think a little bit of physiology from Campos and Welker. And what you see is you get this kind of direct scaling where you just get a large, larger cortical fields, a larger brain, larger body. You have a larger thalamus, larger spinal cord, and so on and so forth. But this is a really nice comparison. This is a California ground squirrel. It weighs about the same size as a, as a guinea, pig, guinea pig. It has a relatively larger neocortex. And something seems to have happened that's really quite different. It has an addition of cortical fields. It also has changes in peripheral morphology. This is another rodent. So these, are, these, these three things are rodents. If I look at something like a squirrel monkey, which weighs 750 grams, about the same size as a, as a California ground squirrel, I see an extraordinary expansion, relative expansion of the cortical sheet, and in addition of more cortical fields. This suggests that in order to increase complexity, and complexity means more cortical fields, differential connectivity that generates more complex behavior, it's necessary, it looks like it's necessary to relatively increase the size of your cortical sheet, it may not be sufficient to generate those changes, but there are two ways in which the cortex seems to get larger, and, 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 and it's organized differently in these different species. So this is work by Molnar and Clowry, and it's really nice, because this is, uh, it, this is a pretty complicated size, a slide, but, if you look at neurogenesis during development, you have radioglial cells, they divide, um, they, they can go back into the system, redivide, go back into the system, they can go up into the um, uh, uh, subventricular zone, become intermediate progenitor cells, um, which can go back into the system, divide, and so on. It, this is a complicated slide, but if you look at something like a mouse versus a human, so a mouse has a little tiny, teeny cortical sheet, and you have something like a human that has an enormous cortical sheet, the proposition is that Something didn't happen de novo in humans. You actually have some of the same processes. You've just exaggerated some of the, these later stages where you have more intermediate progenitor cells that are producing neurons, more intermediate progenitor cells that may go back into the cell cycle. Um, these outer um, radial glial cells can produce more intermediate progenitor cells. So you have this thicker zone of cell projection, uh, uh, thick, thicker zone of neurogenesis, the intermediate where there are intermediate progenitor cells. And so it's really quite simple. There's just slight changes in the cell cycle kinetics, how long neurogenesis takes, how, uh, the rate at which cells reproduce, um, how many inter intermediate progenitor cells you have. And this is probably genetically mediated. So all you have to do is a little tiny tweak, and you can get an exponential increase in the size of the cortical sheet. And, it's, and that is likely to be genetically mediated. Interestingly, I will say that there are a very few studies that demonstrate that you can actually have environmental uh, environmental impact 
on the size of the cortical sheet, folic acid, for example. So there are external factors, or completely extrinsic to the animal, based on diet, that can change cell cycle kinetic cell cycle kinetics and, and change the size of your cortical sheet. So, so I'm going to keep going back and forth between, okay, there are genes, but then more and more we realize that, yeah, but we can change all of this. Everything can, everything can happen in a variety of ways. So did I explain that? Is that it's a pretty complicated slide, but the, the point is there's not much new under the sun. There's just, a, there's just some slight changes in a, in a program that's, that already appears to be in place of neurogenesis of the neocortex in mammals. So genes intrinsic to the neocortex, and this is study from, these are, this is work from uh, Dennis O'Leary's lab, can also change the relative size of cortical fields. This is a mouse brain. Unfortunately, I don't know why they do this. They put rostral to the top. This is medial. Here's the primary visual cortex. This is a serotonin stain. Here's the primary somatosensory area. You can see it really nicely. This is an, what I call an architectonic analysis. What they've done is they, there are transcription factors that are expressed very early in development in the neocortex in a mouse. Um, and they've changed the expression, so they've overexpressed EMX2. And EMX2 for, forms a gradient from rostral to caudal. I have a cartoon of this. By changing EMX2, you can see that they've changed the size of V1. It's now relatively larger, and they've, they've slightly pushed S, S1 forward. And I think this cartoon shows it a little bit better. So normally, it's expressed in a, in a gradient, high to low, uh, medial, medial caudal to rostral lateral. If you don't express it, if you, if you, in this case, you've deleted it, there's no expression. This is primary somatosensory, visual, auditory in a normal mouse. What you've done is you've rostralized cortex. You've pushed everything back, you've, 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 and you've smushed V1 way back here. If you place injections in a normal animal in V1 versus S1, and you look at the lamic input to that cortex, S1 receives the lamic input from somatosensory nuclei of the thalamus. V1 receives input from uh, visual nucleus of the thalamus, and I can change that if I put injections in the same location, I'm actually changing or shifting my thalamocortical connections to accommodate differences in the cortical sheet. OK, now that's all I'm going to say about genes intrinsic to the neocortex and how they help define some aspects of the cortical phenotype, including relative size of cortical fields, size of the cortical sheet, and, and cortical connectivity. So no one's arguing that genes can't specify those so things. How many genes are involved in this? What's that? How many genes are roughly regulated? So, uh, right, so EMX2 then has a, an impact on downstream genes. So it's sort of this, so this is, why, this is why I think there are constraints. I am not a molecular developmental biologist, sure. but you have, it's sort of a, it's a contingency. If that, this happens, then this will happen. If this happens, then this, if this happens. You have this genetic cascade, which can, which can also um, affect other genetic cascades. There are a lot. There, are, there appear to be a lot of, there are some early morphogens, and there are transcriptional factors, and there are downstream genes that, that regulate different aspects of cortical development, like, okay, here's the front of the brain and here's the back of the brain, something as simple as that. Um, there's not, a, as far as I know, very few people have found a one-to-one -one gene cortical field correspondence. It, what you get are these kind of gradients that interact, you know, rostrocaudal, medial lateral, that interact in, in different ways. But, and because it's like, if this happens, this will happen, if this happens, this will happen, I think that's why you have something like a blind mole rat where you can't get rid of V1, because if you pull out the if, really early in the equation, you're going to have a non-viable animal. The other reason is genetic pleiotropy. So those genes could be doing something else completely, regulating heart rate exactly right. or regulating diaphragm in the brainstem. Mm -hmm. So you get rid of it or you modify it and you have something that's not viable. So while genes can generate a lot of interesting aspects of the phenotype and generate vari variability across species, they also constrain evolution in a huge way in the way in which they're deployed during development. It's, it's inevitable. Okay. So, Leo, um, so something like these transcription factors, uh, how much do we understand uh, about those genetic cascades and how, and how the gradient gives rise to different cell types? And so, There's a fair amount. I mean, and that's a whole different realm. I, I mean, I really like Dennis O'Leary's work. He's done some really, he has some really great reviews. Um, Zoltan Molnar has some really nice, so Zoltan Molnar does some beautiful comparative early molecular development. He'll look at turtle. He looks at um, monodelphus. He'll look at uh, uh, mouse and do these comparisons, looking at early transcription or, or early neurogenesis. That one slide was from him. And, and I think comparative molecular development is really, really important. Uh, Luis Puelles uh, in, in Spain. Do you guys know Luis? He does really nice comparative molecular development. He looks at birds. Um, I think he's doing some mammals. So I think that's a whole field that a lot of people aren't doing it at the evolution of neurogenesis or the, you know, 
how these patterns of early genes intrinsic to the neocortex that are specifying aspects of cortical organization um, vary in different species. And you know what? People don't even do it in the same species. We don't want to even talk about variability, but I've never even seen a mouse study where, I, where they show me, okay, here's EMX2 expression in early mouse development, and I'm going to show you, it's probably, there's got to be some normal distribution if you look at a population, because there is variability within a species as well, and how much is that, of that is due to variability in expression patterns versus, you know, environment. Anyway, okay, so when people are talking about the neocortex and genes intrinsic to the neocortex, that is developmental neurobiology of the neocortex. But I love this work. This is by Kritos. I think it's really extraordinary. So here is a bat wing, and here's a mouse hand. So this is forelimb morphology and hindlimb morphology, forelimb morphology, hindlimb morphology. And he's, there, are a number of factor, there are a number of factors, but not as many as you would think. Early in limb development that, that generates something like this versus something like this, this has, here's D1, D2, D3, or D4, D5, forelimb, elongation of the forelimb, growth of interdigit membranes, elongation of the digits, um, except for, and, and a, a, a D1 that, actually sort of forms a hook and so on, whereas you have something like a mouse hand. This is just showing embryonic development of the forelimb and expression of PRX1. He does, so this guy does sort of comparative limb development. And he, what he's saying is that just small changes here in the expression pattern of PRX1 can generate changes um, in the limb. This, this is not the only thing that happens. There are other things that are going on, but this um, can actually explain elongation of the forelimb, for example. So you can have these small changes to um, body morphology. And I love it because it's sort of like expansion of the neocortex. It's, it's just a couple little tweaks. It's not anything that's happening de novo. There are also um, little, touch domes on, uh, little touch domes on these wings that are exquisitely sensitive to air pressure, um, which would seem really important for self-propelled propelled flight. If I look at the forelimb representation, of course they have a huge auditory representation if you're a microcoropter and bat, but if I look at the forelimb representation of a bat, it's really, really large compared to that of a mouse. Now, is it really, really large compared to the mouse because there's something intrinsic to the neocortex that says you're a bat and this is your wing? Or is it simply changes in a, a peripheral morphology, receptor density, and use that is, that is driven this sort of change? So I think it's really important to, to look at the development of the body and the body plan. And ultimately, I'll show you the use and, and the environment in which an organism unravels. So here, and, and so we, I'm going to call, this is, there's a term for this, it's called cortical magnification. We know it really well in the mouse and rat, where you have these specialized vibrissae pads. Tony talked about them yesterday. You look at primary somatosensory cortex, and you've got this beautiful barrel cortex. Um, Ken Catania has done some beautiful work in the star nose mole, where we see the same sort of cortical magnification of these uh, sort of follicles of the nose. This is the animals. He's, he's uh, likened this nose to a, a retina or a fovea, saying this is, this is the animal's world. And apparently, he came and gave a talk at, at uh, University of California, Davis. He got, he didn't even know this was going to happen. So have you guys ever heard Ken Catania give a talk? If you do, if you haven't, you should try to uh, get, hear him give a talk. He's done uh, uh, behavior on these guys with, you know, free, uh, frozen frame, looking at how they capture food, prey, and everything. Apparently, they're super, super fast. Turns out they are the fastest animals in the world, and yes, and what is the um, he? Fast in yeah, to, to just this one behavior is faster than any behavior of any. Guinness sent him a certificate, the Guinness yeah. World Records. He said he got it in the mail, <laughs> and <laughs> so he actually has a prize from Guinness, which I think is kind of <laughs> kind of cool, right? But if you ever get a chance to see these, they're they're extraordinary. They so small brained animals can do really complex things as well. This is also from Ken Catania, where this is the um, naked mole rat. Huge um, and representation of the incisors. This is uh, the amount of cortex that's of S1 that's devoted to different representations. They can independently move um, their mandibles, and they're exploring objects with their teeth. So I talked about cortical magnification as one of those th things that change. This is just a, a schematic. This is the star-nosed mole, so the, here's S1. The amount of cortex devoted to a specialized body part in the teeth here. And I mean, if we want to talk about human neocortex, we have Broca's area, which people consider to be a human um, phenomena. But in reality, it's following the same exact rules of construction of other species. You have 
alterations to the supralaryngeal tract, changes to the oral um, morphology, changes in receptor density on the tongue, lips, and palate. And you have an expansion of the face representation in, uh, in primary somatosensory cortex, motor cortex, and premotor cortex. And you can call it Broca's area, but it follows the same rules of construction that we see for cortical magnification of behaviorally relevant body parts of other species. And obviously, there are genes that are associated with changes in this peripheral morphology, but some of it is likely to be used. And I'm going to get to that part um, in this little bit later. OK, so how are cortical fields added? And I added this because we, you know, we came up with this idea in 1995. And I'm not certain that this theory is correct, but it generated a lot of really cool questions that I'm going to talk about for the last part of my talk. So, and I, get, and I showed this last time I was here, but I don't think anybody remembers. There's been too much alcohol in between. <laughs> Lots of cortical remodeling. I don't even remember. OK. <laughs> So I talked about modules and the increase in cortical field number. So this is, now this is not, a, this is a megacoropterin bat, big huge wings. Had to catch those too when I was in Australia, by the way. And uh, that, was, that was pretty exciting and fun. Now these are not echolocators. They have an amazing visual system. Notice that the eyes, unlike a lot of other species, the eyes have rotated rostrally. Beautiful visual system. This is their somatosensory cortex. This is rostral, this is medial. This is an architectonic, this is a myelin stain, so you, you um, pull the cortex off the brainstem and thalamus, you flatten it, and you cut it tangential to the cortical surface, which is I've been showing you so far. And this is stain for myelin. And this is actually the body representation. We've done electrophysiology of the primary somatosensory cortex of a bat. You can actually see its little individual toes, digits. This is the forelimb representation, face representation. But we noticed that it wasn't homogeneous, but it was sort of uh, heterogeneous or modular in appearance, where you have this myelin light zone interdigitated with these myelin dense zones. And we said, hmm, that's like the barrels of a rat uh, or you know, uh, cytochrome oxidase blobs in V1 of a primate. So what we did is we got a, a, our electrode and we went in really, really densely and we recorded from these myelin dense zones and these myelin light zones. And what we found was something really interesting. Normally, so this is the foot representation. So if I stick an electrode in here, I, I have receptive fields on the foot, receptive fields on the wing, receptive fields on the face, receptive fields on the tongue. So of course, that's what I found. But in these interdigitated zones, I found an additional representation. And that if I didn't, and, and, and an additional representation back here, and if I didn't include these interdigitated parts with this caudal representation, I wouldn't have a complete representation of the contralateral body. So I had one representation, which is S1, let's say foot, limb, um, face. Then I had this other representation that was like this. So I started thinking, OK, so. When we're doing our comparative analysis, what has changed? We're looking at a frozen frame. I'm taking an individual that's living on the planet, that's moving, and I'm stopping that. And I'm looking at its neocortex. And of course, this is in a certain point in time. Species you know, have come from somewhere and are moving toward, well, not necessarily moving towards something, but will change in the future. So we said, OK, so what I'm looking at is a frozen frame in the evolution of a cortical field. That, in fact, maybe this is telling us a little something about how cortical fields evolve. And that this interdigitated field is, is part of some intermediate stage of an earlier form. And I'm going to explain kind of what I mean. So we went back and looked at this modular organization in a lot of different species. So this is the classic you know, barrel of a, of a rat. This is the nose of a star-nosed mole. So we see this kind of modular organization where these things are sort of segregated in a lot of different species. This is the bill of a platypus. I'll show you later. You can't see it really well, but there's cytochromoxase light and dark regions that are associated with electrosensory and uh, mechanosensory reception. These are stripes in V2 of a squirrel monkey, and so on and so forth. Even in the absence of some sort of architectonic modular organization within these fields, cortical connections are never homogeneous. They're always patchy. So you say, well, you know, the way I used to define a cortical field, and I've been showing you these cartoons where the cortical fields are solid, but they really don't look like that. They don't have these beautiful sharp edges. V1 does. But really, what you're seeing is, is not quite as, as clear. So we said, well, maybe it's something like this. Maybe, and let this be some pattern of thalamocortical um, uh, connections. So here's field A, field B, and field C. Yellow dots are some pattern, you know, input from VP, input from medial geniculate, input from visual cortex. You have an invasion of new inputs which form modules. And maybe you have an invasion of new inputs because you have new um, changes in receptor morphology on the body. Um, you have separation of, of, of hairs into whiskers. Um, you have a realignment of existing inputs, or you can have a discorrelation from the thalamus. Um, 
you, can, you get a, an aggregation of similar inputs that were initially completely embedded within the field or had this modular organization. So you get these partially embedded fields like I saw in the flying fox. You can have a complete aggregation and invasion of new inputs and so on and so forth. And that any one of these, and, and, and I should be able to see this in any species. This is a frozen frame, this is a frozen frame, frozen frame, frozen frame. That, that I'm looking at you know, sort of stages in the evolution of a cortical field. And that this, where you have this complete segre segregation, I don't think, I'm not certain exists in any species. It's th that's our theoretical construct that makes it easier for us to segregate cortical fields. But usually my frozen frames look something like this, or something like this, or something like this. So this is. Can you say something about the proportions of this? So over, over let's say, 100 animals, how often would case B occur versus case C? Or is it more also mixed? It's mixed. And so let me, I'll show you the movie. Um, I'll show, I'm, I'm gonna, I made a little movie. And the movie is based on mainly imagination, right? So it's, what I'm doing, I'm going to show you what I, what I think is happening in real time over 200 million years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it may not be so, but, but I'm going to pose some questions after, after I show you the movie. <laughs> I got, a, I got a movie. I mean, Tony had movies. I have movies of animals, too. <laughs> but I have movies of cartoons, <laughs> which were, were, were made after way too many drinks. OK, so let's see if this is going to work. I'm ha I've been having trouble with my movies. Oops. OK, so let me just get out of this and see if I can. OK, just bear with me, guys. I mean, you want to see, you're dying to see the movie. Tell me you're not. Of course. All right, all right. I'm just checking. I mean, I need a little more enthusiasm for the movie. <laughs> That's why we got you back here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Start to be supportive. Okay, here we go. Something's weird with my PowerPoint. It does this every single time, and it drives me nuts. Okay, let's see. Okay, here we go. So... Is it going to work? So I'm going to show you what you're going to see. This is primary somatosensory visual auditory. This is the brain of an early mammal. So you're going to see an increase in the oh shucks. You're going to see an increase in the size of the cortical sheet with an invasion of new inputs that form mod modules. And then um, okay, here we go. Here we go. I won't say anything. Just look at one portion because otherwise your head will explode. So an inv invasion of new inputs, forming modules, an aggregation of inputs, partially. Im oh, oh shit! Uh -huh. nice. Wait, let me. No, no, no. Let me do it again. Okay, hold on. I got it. You did do it again. What's that? Do it again. I'm, well, I, okay. All right. All right. All right. I, know, I shouldn't have had that second cup of coffee. <laughs> that was grim. Okay. Here I go. I'm not, okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna look at it. <laughs> So you get it. Mm -hmm. So I should be able to stop this at any point, and it should look like a mammal brain. And it does look like a mammal brain. Beautiful. I believe you. You probably got it. I'm giving you that 50 bucks, I promised. <laughs> OK, so you get the general idea. So, so this is what we think is happening. And the gray would be filled in with more cortical fields, but it um, get too complicated. So a relative increase in the size of the cortical sheet. So some places you have modular organization, some places you have partially embedded fields, some places you have fields that are fully aggregated, and so on and so forth. And this would explain some of those terrible controversies about fine details about this cortical area versus that. Is MT divided into this in the early four? That may be that, something that is not quite formed. That's right. Or, or, or no, but yeah. still, there's a problem here because this, this might be a way to fractionate a field, but at some point you need to genetically stabilize it. At, exactly. Right? Right. So, so I'm not even, I, I won't even say that this, I, I think this is 100% correct, because I, I no, can't know that. I, I, I don't debate that, but if this is the dynamic of it that Bjorn likes, right, in terms of its controlling mechanism, you can fractionate using, let's say, use, but then you have to stabilize. That's right, but that's, the, but that's the question. Right at what point? Let's say it does fractionate initially because of use. Yeah. But at what point does that become genetically encoded and evolve? That's the really huge question. And is it just due to drift, or is it due to you know some sort of other mechanism? And I, I don't want to sound Lamarckian, but um, and I, well, I but, but but that's the huge question. So you'll see as I go through my talk, I'm going to show you some really extraordinary things 
I can change the cortex in huge ways without changing genes at all, okay. but just changing incoming input. So the, the question is, if I take away the, 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 somebody asked this yesterday, what happens if I take away the barrels of a, of a, of a or the whiskers of a rat? That might not be the best example, but how much of that is genetically encoded and how much of that is activity dependent? And we know that if you take away the whiskers, those barrels start to smudge together or they get large and so on and so forth. Um, what, would a, what would a rat cortex look like in a, in, in a, in a, a bat's body? I mean, so th it's a complicated question. So, so that work from 1995 generated these questions. So we said, okay, a cortical field is actually a pattern of unique connectivity um, that shifts and redistributes with, within a lifetime and in species over time. Yep. Uh, I love the movie. It's like a Matisse. It's, it's a <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you, you said it, uh, you're talking about invasion of new connections. Invasion of new inputs. But that, that sounds like it's all coming from the periphery up to the cortex. Isn't it possible for the cortex to go out and change the body? Absolutely. Well, okay. So I use the example of the lamocortical afferents, but that could be colossal, that could be cortical cortical connections as well. It doesn't just have to be from the body. What's generating that? Is there some sort of discorrelation in groups of thalamic nuclei? Um, I don't know. And it could be it could be cortical cortical. It could be thalamic cortical. But say that evolution is only one. Uh, do you see that as being invasion of cortex by some uh, motor neurons further down? Not it necessarily. Could cortex, it, so could be, it could be. It could be. It could be the cortex. Yes. Yes. Which then feeds back to the cortex because well, you have further. you have differential use. It goes further, right? Because you might also want to change your sensor sheets to periphery, the way you actuate them, the way the consequences of processing translate into further actuation, and so on. It's not only within the nervous system; but you have to have some sort of co-evolution. Right? And and this is not and this is not. I mean, maybe I'm presenting this as an open loop. It's not an open loop. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. It's not an open loop because you can have cortical cortical. Then you can you can have cortical cortical connections that are doing this, but then you have uh, motor cortex um, feeding into subcortical structures yeah. and the spinal cord and working the body. Use then in turn generates changes in the neocortex. So, right? Well, something like the corticospinal pathway. Right. I always right. thought of it as cortex going down into the spinal cord. Yeah. But what, what drives that? That's a good question. <laughs> and, and and I mean a really nice example is if you look at uh, cortical spinal pr projections in different primates, those that have, you know, like old world monkeys have opposable thumb, precision grip, um, and they have lots of direct cortical spinal projections directly to the alpha motor neurons that work the, the digits. You don't see that in other, other species. New world monkeys don't really have that because they don't have precision grips. They have this, except the Cebus monkey, which has independently evolved a precision grip like this, and it's independently evolved cortical spinal projections directly to alpha motor neurons. So, so what's, what's, what's driving that? I mean, they have independent evolution of peripheral morphology and independent evolution of central uh, nervous system organization. And you know, what, 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 what started the whole thing? And, I mean, wouldn't uh, actually the uh, variability they, that, that you see in, in different individuals plus uh, uh, the, the, the demand, so it, it's an advantage to be able to do this. Right. Uh, and then over a million years or so. Right, I agree. It's, I have a last slide that says it. So, there, so a huge portion is, is going to be you have normal variability of some aspect of the phenotype, and then you have an environment, and, and, and this, this part, portion of the distribution is selected for, and it's, the genes are already there. And then the whole, the whole distribution shifts. I agree completely. Yes. Okay. Anyway, so these are, the, these are the questions that got generated here. Um, is there a redistribution of afferents on the cortical sheet with alterations in cortical field size, um, changes in peripheral morphology and use, um, and studies of development can inf inform us about this. So now I'm going to talk about our experiments where we've experimentally induced changes in the size of the cortical sheet and see if the remaining cortex will take on visual function. Um, can, and can, if it does, can we direct and amplify this plas plasticity um, and generate um, contextually optimal behavior. So here's the little guy. So the rest of the talk is going to be about these weird manipulations. I got to I got to speed it up a little bit because I'm I'm at 50 no, minutes. No worries. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I talk fast anyway. All right. So no, and I always feel like there's only so long in terms of attention that you can listen to somebody, and I'm going to have to do something crazy like dance with a lampshade on my head to keep your attention. Okay. Um, you won't. <laughs> 
I will later, tomorrow, Wednesday, Wednesday. I, I got the lampshade all, all sorted out. OK, so this is little Monodelphus domestica. It's a South American opossum. This is its neocortex. And there are a number of reasons that this is a really nice animal to work with. Beautiful cortical. Look at this, this neocortex. Here's V1. And we've, this is architect, architecture, but we've stuck an electrode in there. We've looked at anatomical connections. This is S1. This is primary auditory cortex. But here's the beauty. Um, here's a rat. Um, here's a monodelphus. Here's P0, here's embryonic day 14, and here's P0 of a, of a rat. And these are the kinds of things that are happening. So interesting things are happening, thalamocortical afferentation, neurogenesis, cortical plate formation, all postnatally in these guys. So we can make manipulations to their developing nervous system ex utero. And here's, here's a really nice example. So this is a P, I think that's a P, uh, I want to say a P4 animal. And you can see they're really tiny. They don't even have hind limbs yet. They just have little forelimb buds, just a little eye spot. Um, thalamocortical, this is P4. Thalamocortical afferents don't reach the cortex until about P5 to P7. Um, retinal ganglion cells don't reach the diencephalon until about P5. So in this animal, what we've done, this is their neocortex. This is the midline. Um, we've exposed the neocortex, and we've taken out all of what would, would normally be visual cortex. And we let the animal grow up. And then we do electrophysiologic recording experiments. We do um, anatomical connections and so on. So we're removing P4 really early in development. And, and this was from studies back in 1999 by Huffman. And what we found, here's the remaining cortical sheet. And what we found when we did electrophysiology was that remaining cortex, we, even though we took away all of what would be visual cortex, we still had visual cortex. So are we getting a redistribution of afferent, or thalamocortical afferents on the cortical sheet? It looks like we are. And we actually, we did anatomical connections. So if I took away, if I, if I take a sheet that's this big, and now I'm making it this big, if there's something inherent, completely inherent about V1 and visual cortex in A1, if it's being completely genetically specified, then all I should be left with is a big S1, especially here, where I've gotten taken away a huge portion of the sheet. But what I get is an S1, an A1, and a V1. The representations aren't all over the place. They're still in the location they're supposed to be. If I put neuroanatomical tracers in the remaining cortical sheet, here's the opposite hemisphere. Normally, this portion of cortex would get projections from the ventral posterior nucleus of the thalamus, because it would be in the position of S1. Right now, it's at the very back of the brain. And these are um, labeled cells in the lateral genu geniculate nucleus. So normally, just let me finish, Tony. Normally, lateral geniculate nucleus would be projecting back here. And now, in this brain, it's projecting up here. Yep. Bilaterally? No, but we're starting to do. We're now we're going to start doing it bilaterally. Okay. This is this is. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, this is not the only thing that's going on. Is that these changes in thalamocortical connections? There are probably changes in colossal connections as well. So the newer experiments, I'll show you those. This is um, this is uh, this is a, these are actually done bilaterally, but I'm just just showing you one hemisphere. So this is from Jimmy Dooley in my laboratory, and he's just starting to do lesions at P12. So this was at P4, before thalamocortical afferents had reached the cortical sheet. We're getting a, re a really large respecification of the neocortex. Um, this is P12. Thalamocortical afferents have already reached the cortical sheet. The, the eye has grown into the diencephalon, and we're seeing something really quite different. Um, the, the, uh, the blue is visual um, cortex. The red is uh, uh, somatosensory cortex, and we're actually seeing visual responses, but it's looking really, really disorganized. This is a 3D reconstruction. It's done a nice job. This is the real brain right here, dorsal view. This is um, the lesion back here. He's at, he, you can see it's, it's now missing. This is normal, and this is what this lesion looks like. So it's, it's nice. We can actually measure what's not there. So we're seeing really, di really big differences, and these studies are in progress. Um, and we're finding, using just the optokinetic drum testing, that if we look at visual acuity in these P12 lesions, um, we've affected behavior in a huge way. So... But wait, what, what does this experiment not really mean with respect to cortical field reorganization? Because you could say this patchiness might be some redundancy in the system that you're well you know what anyway. there's, there's a there's, there's that's right that's right there's a there's a, a possibility that you're having you know thalamocortical afferents when they first grow in are probably wildly exuberant and with with right. with um, experience you're getting some sort of refinement mm -hmm. um, and and that's and it's, and it's not happening there but there, the point is that there's something really different at p4 versus p12 um, and this in this animal we didn't do anything we just let the animal grow up in its cage what, we're, what we want to see is if we can actually direct um, 
we can direct this reorganization. That's what, so, so by altering the physical environment in which the animal develops, can we alter cortical organization, cortical field size, cellular composition, neural response properties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so these are studies we're just starting right now where we're lesioning visual cortex prior to and after thalamic cortical afferents innervate the cortex. We're rearing them, I mean, I mean, fair enough, it's pretty simple, but it's a different kind of environment. So now we're trying to direct this. And we're going in and we're looking at, so if I go into what's left, this, what's left of cortex that has now become visual, um, will neurons be tuned to the enhancing stimulus? So this is, from, this is normal data from Monodelphus domestica. And it turns out you do have some neurons that are oriented, have orientation selectivity. Um, you have some neurons that have spatial frequency selectivity, but most neurons are actually fairly broadly tuned. So I just got an email from Jimmy last night. He's been looking at some of these animals that have been reared in this striped condition. And what he's finding is um, a significantly more neurons that are tuned, that are oriented to the uh, a vertical, vertical um, orientation. So it looks like, and he told me I, he wouldn't even give me a slide of it. He said, no, no, I'm just telling you, I've just been crunching the data as fast as I can. I can't give you a slide. So it looks like, in fact, by rearing these animals in a different environment, we can push that cortical phenotype in a, in a very specific direction. But where did you find these neurons? Like in, in the same distributed fashion as what you showed us earlier? We, we're finding them at the caudal pole of the cortex. Okay. With a fairly normal S1, but it's really, it's really new data. So, you know, this was our will, this is our predicted change. Our neurons tune to the enhancing stimulus. This is for spatial frequency. Are we doing something like this if we rear it in a particular spatial frequency? And this is the said, what I just said is that we've kind of just, it looks like we are in fact taking this, broad, this population that's really broadly tuned and tuning it so it's, it's really, really interested in vertical, vertical stimuli. So we're, we're, we're really pushing that cortical phenotype to be a specialist in the environment in which it's, in, it's developing. And so, Tony, this is the test I'm telling you about. So in terms of looking at cortically mediated behavior, so I'm going to show you this. I'm hoping this movie's going to work, and if not, I'll have to click out of it again. I'm going to have to click it out of it again. But this is a Mitchell jumping task. And the, so the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life is done behavior in animals because you really don't, it takes a long time for you to think, I'm really testing what I think I'm testing. And with the monodelphus, like we would have to find, okay, what do they like to eat? Do they like to eat grubs? It turns out they like crickets, but they don't like little crickets. They don't like really big crickets. They like, like medium-sized crickets. And I realized after like six months, I was perfectly trained. I was getting up. I was going to the Ace Hardware, getting crickets, 6.30 every morning, coming in. I mean, I like clockwork. I was so well-trained, and the animal would be like, eh, maybe I'll do a couple tasks. You know? <laughs> So I was, get, I was very well trained, but it turns out we were able to, um, we were able to do this. I'm going to have to, sorry guys, I'm going to have to reload this again because I'm having problems with my PowerPoint. But I do want to show you, I want to show you what you're looking at, what you're looking at is a, this is a computer screen. You're looking at a, a downward view. This is a platform. This is a monodelphus domestica. And we, we've trained the animal to jump to the stripes. And you can change the uh, spatial frequency or cycles per degree of the stripes and you can get an acuity measure. Um, let me see here. So. so that's a permanently conditioned. So they get crickets when they jump on, on, the, on the stripes. Okay. But now we're, you know what? Then we've learned we can give them lunch meat and they're, they're good. <laughs> <laughs> we, give them, we give them lunch meat on a stick and it's fantastic because it's a lot easier. Hold on, let me just do this. Jump file. But it might be also more difficult to train, right? Because then they will be satiated rather quickly, so they will lose their motivation. To well, we, we food deprive them, and now we've actually. I'm going to show you some. Uh, I'm going to show you some other. Uh, I won't. I'll just show you the kind of new stuff we're doing. Okay, so here it is. And where do you see how spastic they are? You'll see what my issues are. So it's looking around, looking, 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 looking. Ah, uh, maybe no, no, looking. Come on, buddy. Come on, come on. And you sit there and you're like, come on, jump, jump, <laughs> jump, yay! <laughs> so that took a long time. <laughs> it took a long time to figure out. But we can get a cutie test on these guys. And it turns out, someone in my laboratory, and I do think, I mean, this is really simple behavior, but behavior is really important to tie into the whole thing. So it's great. We can change connections. We can change neural response properties. But at the end of the day, what does it mean for behavior? That's because that is the target of selection. Um, so now we're just 
I just want to show this really quickly. Um, we're taking advantage of the animal's natural preferences where we found out that they, without having them do anything and just putting them in there at different luminances, do they like to, do they like to hang out on the gray thing or the white thing? And they like to hang out on the gray thing. And then do they like to hang out on the gray or the stripes? They like to hang out on the stripes. So you, just by calculating the amount of time they spend on the stripes versus the gray, and then slowly changing the stripes to increase the spatial frequency so it looks gray, you can get a, a, a really nice acuity test without too much train, without training them at all. So the idea is, um, we've, so we've changed neural response properties. Can we alter visually mediated behavior? OK, so I'm, I'm moving out of the cortex now, and I'm, I'm almost done. I'm moving out of the cortex now, and I'm moving into peripheral morphology. So I said, OK, there are things that are intrinsic to the neocortex, but there are also inputs coming into the neocortex, and there's body morphology that's really important. And I wanted to show you some observations from the natural world. This is my favorite example of all time. This is the duck-billed platypus. It has an extreme morphological specialization of the bill. And on the bill, there are uh, stripes of electrosensory versus mechanosensory receptors that run in stripes. And when this animal jumps in the water and does important things, like capture prey, uh, mate, and so on and so forth, it closes its eyes, its ears, and its nose. And if you look at the neocortex, it's extraordinary. This is a flattened view of the neocortex. This is the uh, front of the brain, the top of the brain. This is a platypunculus. So it's, this is a representation of the, plat the platypus's body, hind paw or hind foot, forepaw, body. Here's the bill in S1. It's enormous. Here's a second representation. Here's the bill. And here's a third representation. And here's the bill. And this is from electrophysiological recording. So about 70% of its entire cortical sheet is devoted to representing the bill. So the question is, is there something intrinsic to the neocortex that's generating this bill representation? Or is it something that's intrinsic to the animal that's, that's generating this body morphology? Or is it use? Because it, it, it shuts, basically shuts down all its other sensory sense systems when it's behaving. Or is it some combination of both? So this is really amazing animal. And of course, you look to extreme specializations to help you understand the general principles of organization. So, Peripheral morphology must play a huge role. So what happens if I remove um, the eyes or, all of, or, or take away the eyes really early in development before they've reached the diencephalon? So what I'm basically doing is changing, dramatically changing the proportion of sensory input coming into the cortex. I'm completely removing visual inputs. So now these animals are left with auditory, olfactory, respiratory, ooh, um, and somatosensation. So we did that at P4, and what we found was that there was no, no overall change in the size of the cortical sheet. This is the, this is the front of the brain. This is the top of the brain. Here's V1, S1, V2. This is a bilateral nucleated animal. We can still find a little tiny V1, just like in our blind mole rats. We can't get rid of it. Um, but it's much, much smaller. So if I, look, if I do measurements of those cortical fields, what I find is that, is that S1 is larger, V1 is a lot smaller, and this other visual region, CT, has changed in size as well. If I do electrophysiological recordings, so all of these dots are electrode sites, and the color represents the type of stimulus that drove that neuron. So in a normal animal, and if I'm back in visual cortex, blue is visual stimulation, uh, green is auditory stimulation, and red is somatosensory stimulation. That's a normal animal. This is a bilateral nucleate. So this is all visual cortex. So all of what would be visual cortex is now taken over by the auditory and somatosensory system, as is here. So I've done nothing to the cortex itself, didn't change any genes to the cortex. I've just changed the, the input coming into the cortex really early in development, and I've completely respecified the cortical phenotype. So in terms of sensory domain allocation, I've really, really shifted it. If you notice, though, this is one animal. This is a different animal. There's different. They're, they're, it's variable. This almost has all somatosensory responses, and this has some sort of mix, and some neurons are doing both. And I will say um, we hand-reared these animals without really thinking too much about how we were hand rearing them. So their early experiences were really different. If I look at, oh, so Tony, you might be interested in this. And if I look at the body parts that were represented in that, that individual cortex, that respecified cortex that was somatosensory, it's mainly snout, face, fibrissi, and head. Those were the receptive, like tons of receptive fields um, on those body parts. And presumably, this is all carried by cortical cortical connections. I'm probably thalamocortical and maybe some cortical cortical. Well, I'm going to show you. I'll show you the cortical cortical connections. In this, in, you believe that there's also a, a rewiring of the thalamocortical. Oh yeah. Uh, well, I, well, I don't believe it. I know. I'm going to show you a picture. Okay, right. I know it. I put right. in a. Hey, 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 hey. Talk to the hand. 
I'm going to show you. I put neuroanatomical tracer in there. You didn't show the, it yet. But the well, I'm going to show it. I'm going to show. It. But the point <laughs> is, um, if so, if I looked at if I if I did a if I did a um, an unculus of like what is the body representation and how much of the cortex does it assume in this animal, it would be a big, huge snout, head, and face, not just for S1, but also for all of that reorganized cortex. So we did, in fact, put anatomical tracers into what was, this is V1 in a normal animal. You can't see it. The, the injection site is right here. And it's getting input from the second visual area, getting input from CT and entorhinal cortex. And it gets input from the lateral posterior nucleus and lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. This is in a bilateral nucleate in what architectonically defined V1 or area 17. It's getting inputs from somatosensory cortex. It's getting inputs from auditory cortex. So it, yes, changes in, in cortical cortical connectivity. But this is ventral posterior. It's also getting input from the ventral posterior nucleus. Normally, it would be, this cortex would get input from the lateral geniculate. So if I look at the total pattern of alterations, this is a normal animal. Here are cortical cortical connections. Or, sorry, thalamocortical connections. Here are cortical connections. And these are the changes in thalamocortical inputs and changes in cortical inputs. So I'm inducing alterations in cortical field size, um, sensory domain allocation, cortical connections without doing anything to the cortex itself. I'm just changing what inputs it has access to. And let's say roughly the physiological signature of these neurons remains identical to what you would have found in V1 in terms of, let's say, their well, the variation, the mean firing rates, and so on. That's what we're working on now. That's what I'm going to show you right now. So, okay. so what I just showed you in terms of electrophysiology was just sensory, pre just preference. Oh, sure. But what we, that's exactly what we're looking at. What we're also trying to do is, can I take that plasticity and direct it by rearing an animal in a tactically enhanced environment? I won't go through the details of the tactile enhancement, but we start doing the tactile enhancement. And this is what you're talking about. So we've also, this is just a normal animal where, where we're trying to calculate using controlled stimulus, um, the, the sorts of things that you're talking about. And it's the same idea as, as the visual experiment. Can we, um, can we tune neurons to the, uh, this, this, the relevant stimulus that the animal's being reared with? So can we change, um, can we direct that plasticity instead of it just sometimes being auditory and sometimes being somatosensory and some, sometimes being mixed? But can we tune the neurons to the enhancing stimulus? And I'm not going to go through, I'm going to, that's just the behavioral stuff. We're doing more behavioral stuff. And can we generate, um, uh, appropriate, or, or can we change sensory behavior as well, or sensory mediated behavior? And I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about that. That's also cellular composition, because I want to get to the last, the very last portion of my talk. But you guys are sort of getting the idea. So can I change, can I change aspects of the phenotype that are naturally being changed in evolution? And can I drive the phenotype? How far can I push the phenotype and ultimately push behavior? Okay, so the last very last bit, natural differences in the physical environment in which the individu individuals develop induce alterations in cortical field size, organization, and neuron number. So these are nice comparative experiments. We did them on a bunch of different rodents, and this is a comparative thing. But I want to show you two really interesting things. Um, we've got a regular laboratory Norway rat, and then we've got a wild-caught Norway rat. So my a graduate student, Katie Campy, went out and caught wild rats. And let me tell you, whoo boy, they're mean. <laughs> But <laughs> they're, they don't like being caught. <laughs> but they're beautiful. So we did a couple of really similar measurements. So this is the same species. There might be some strain difference, but it's the same species, Radis norvegus. And she measured, just started off by measuring cortical field areas. And, and this, she also did wild caught squirrels. But I'll just, um, the blue is laboratory rats, and the, the red is wild caught rats. And there are significant differences in the size of auditory cortex with the Wild uh, laboratory rat having a larger auditory cortex, we think it's because it's the sense that's probably less impacted um, um, by the rearing condition, and have also having a larger uh, somatosensory cortex. She also did what's called isotropic fractionator, where you decompose the neocortex, you break it, you, you take the neocortex off, um, you homogenize it, you break up all the cell bodies, and you look at nuclei. So you stain all nuclei for DAPI, and then you stain neurons with new N, and you can look at OK, what is the proportion of cells that are neurons? What are the proportions of cells that are non-neurons? You can get ideas about neuron, neuronal density and so on. And this is what she did. And what she found was wild-caught rats are in orange. Uh, laboratory rats are in uh, blue. And this means significantly different. So if we look at percentage of neurons in primary visual cortex, um, wild-caught rats have significantly more. Um, neuronal density in primary visual cortex, wild-caught rats have significantly more. If we look at things like encephalization quotient um, or the, you know, and we look at things like uh, somatic neuronal quotient, you have significant differences or real differences in wild-caught 
and laboratory red rodents. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We didn't, do, we didn't look at cortical-cortical connections and so on and so forth. But you have the same species reared in radically different conditions. And of course, reviewers for this said, well, you couldn't control the natural environment. But I, I, I think I can easily argue, well, you know, I think it's a little more complicated than the box, the laboratory, the laboratory box that the animal's reared in, and that the visual demands of that environment are probably much greater. So the final thing, and that is, so, so guys, I've gone from cortex to periphery. I hope you're following my, I think. I've gone to very radical changes in peripheral morphology, like I'm removing the eyes. That's, that's like taking a sledgehammer to the system, to like, OK, now I'm not doing anything. I'm just looking at the visual system in, an, in a natural versus a laboratory environment. And now I'm just going to look at natural differences in behavior and rearing conditions and what that does to the cortex. And this is a, a, a prairie vole. It's got um, these. Uh, lots and lots of little hairs around its mouth. It's got hairs growing into its palate. So they, it has a, a oral facial morphology that we think is really important um, for discrimination. It has hairs on its nose. has a large olfactory system. Uh, and if you look at their, what's nice, this is in co collaboration with Karen Bales. If you look at prairie voles, they're monogamous. So both the uh, mother and father rear the young. And there are natural differences in the population where you have what we call high contact versus low contact parents. High contact parents are spending a lot of time doing, in terms of mother and father, well, not, not father, <laughs> mother, <laughs> the, the amount of time they spend nursing, um, picking up their infants, uh, huddling. So this is total parental behavior, um, uh, paternal behavior, parental behavior. But Karen has broken it into, literally, she does um, video camera analysis, how much time they're contacting, physically contacting the animal. And most often, it's in this kind of oral facial area. So there are natural differences in how they do these. So you, you're breaking them into these two groups. So, and I'm not saying one is better versus worse, but one is there's not as much contact and one there's a lot of contact. And if we do an electrophysiological analysis on a high contact versus a low contact animal, we see that in S1, the amount of cortex devoted to this portion of the face is expanded or quite large. In, in high contact versus low contact. And we don't have a ton of animals, so I don't have any error bars on here. But I think you can see those differences. And if we look at, this is the extraordinary thing. If we look at cortical-cortical connections, and this is really hard because you have to match injections to the same representation. You have to, mat, you have to make sure it's, the size is the same. But what we did was we put an injection in this oral facial representation in S1 in a high contact versus a low contact. And what we saw was generally the patterns of connections look quite similar. But there are differences. So in this uh, frontal myelinated region, we have a lot of projections to um, S1 in low contact and not high contact. And if we look at the parietal rhinal area, we have lots of projections. We also have changes in thalamocortical connections as well. And these are as a percent of the in number of cells that we counted. So we're kind of, um, if there are some differences in the size of the injection, we're taking that into account by looking at relative um, changes in connectivity. So we have changes in the cortical magnification of a behaviorally relevant body part. We have changes in cortical and thalamocortical connections. And now we haven't done anything. We're just taking natural differences, really early experiences uh, of parental uh, rearing styles, and measuring something that's not esoteric like love, but the amount of time <laughs> you're, you're actually touching the individual. You can induce these sort of, sort of changes in the cortical phenotype. So I'm, do I'm done. I'm going to sum up right now. So. Uh, there are multiple intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms that can change the same aspect of the cortical phenotype. So I talked about alterations in cortical field size. Um, you, can make it, you can make the neocortex larger. I said a lot of that's probably genetically determined, and you can just change cell cycle kinetics. But um, diet can actually change the um, size of the cortical sheet as well. Uh, you can have alterations in genes intrinsic to the neocortex, um, which can change cortical field size. And I showed you that with the EMX2. Um, you can have alterations in genes intrinsic to the developing body. I showed you an example with the, the wing of a bat and where I can change the size of a representation. Alterations to receptor array. Um, and alterations in the physical environment. So, so my problem was I would say, OK, how do I change the size of the cortical sheet? Or, or maybe more specifically, how would I change, how does evolution change um, the size of a cortical field? Well, the, there are a number of factors that contrib contribute to the size of a cortical field. Some are intrinsic to the neocortex. Some are intrinsic to the animal um, and in, involved in changes in body morphology. Some are extrinsic, and it's the environmental way in which the animal's developing. So there isn't a single way that I can change the same aspect of a cortical phenotype. There are multiple ways, and it's probably th these, pro these things are probably happening in various combinations in different species.
And something important to keep in mind in our gene-centric world is when I talk about genes, I have to be really careful because these are, sorry, this is pretty, pretty uh, fun, funky. But here are genes that are regulating body events. Here are genes that are regulating brain events. And I talked about EMX2 and there's PAC6 and so on. These, in turn, regulate developmental processes. These regulate aspects of cortical phenotype. But the targets of selection aren't out here or here. And they're not even here. And here's an environmental context which in this case. And this is an example from the bat wing and the mouse hand. Wind velocity, um, number of photons in the environment, um, um, high energy prey with distinct auditory emissions. So what's being selected for um, are things like um, interdigit membrane size, um, length of the forelimb, um, visual discrimination abilities, auditory discrimination abilities. Not this stuff out here, but this, not, or this stuff out here, but this stuff in here. And this stuff in here is oftentimes uh, far removed from the genes that, are, uh, that, that co-vary with that aspect of the phenotype. So I think that's something really important to keep in mind. So I told you at the beginning of my talk that this used to be the title of my talk, but it's not really a well-posed question because there are other factors that, that influence um, the cortical, what you want to find out is what factors influence the cortical phenotype. And, 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 and if use influences the cortical phenotype and the animal grows up in, a, in, a, in an environment or a context that is um, static across generations, you can have alterations of the cortical phenotype that aren't necessarily genetically mediated and, and they may masquerade as what we consider traditional evolution, but the only reason they keep popping up over and over again is because the environmental context triggers that particular phenotype. The cellular mechanisms that give rise to plasticity may in fact be genetically mediated. And there may be differences in the amount or the, the, the extent to which a uh, species can be plastic. But the phenotype itself may not, be the, may, not, may not be the thing that's evolving. So what factors can contribute to the cortical phenotype? Well, genes, and I showed you that it can contribute to cortical sheet size, cortical field size, connections, morphology, I didn't talk about cellular me mechanisms involved in plasticity. The environment can also um, affect um, some of the same aspects of the cortical phenotype, like size, connections, and morphology. I gave you examples of the bill of the platypus, the tongue larynx slips of a human. And if we talk about things that I don't like talking about, social learning, language, and culture, which are human conditions, I think if we, we need to break them into what they really are, and they're just complex patterns of physical stimuli that are impinging on the developing nervous system, um, and that they continue to impinge on the developing nervous system across generations, and we can get something that masquerades as evolution. And this is, you're not, I'm really sorry, the, the words are really small, but this is from a recent review we did. And so this is morphology, and this is environmental context, and this is actually human, this is a tree of human evolution, hominins back here, chimpanzees broke off here, and these are the, these are morphological things that are happening, like the presence of FOXP2 was around about a, 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 um, a, a million years ago. I can't even read it myself. Um, aspects of uh, changes in the, um, lar the larynx, the hyoid bone, were around a, a long time ago. Uh, alterations in the hand or the morphology of the hand was around before the Neanderthal human split. So this is the anatomical things that we know from fossil records and, and comparative analysis. But if we look at the social environmental things, we really don't have the, you know, and, and there's a debate of when language occurred. We had the anatomy, we had the body, we had the receptor density, we had the morphology, but we didn't have language. That, that occurred more recently. And so one wonders if these complex abilities are, 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 and I think, really, really context dependent, and they're just occurring across generations. And at some point, things start to snowball. And if you look at you know, modern industrial revolution and, our, and how we've actually changed the planet. That's occurred within, within the past 300 years, 400 years, and, and probably with no change to the genome. Um, but these um, activity-dependent mechanisms um, are kicking in place a transgenerational. So if I took me and, and developed me back here, I would look like a phenotype back here. Okay, so. That's going to be the end of my talk, but I want to um, just introduce my laboratory. This is Jimmy Dooley, who did a lot of the stuff on Monadelphus and is continuing to do stuff on developing Monadelphus. Um, Adele Selke did some of the isotropic fractionator stuff and is working on the Vol stuff. Um, other people in my laboratory didn't contribute to all this work. They're doing work on primates and, and, and different sorts of things. Um, Wong was the guy who was involved in training the Monadelphus, which is great. And um, these are my sources of funding, other people in my laboratory. Okay, um, I'm done. <laughs>